like the first the first point of cell theory is that all life comes from pre-existing life, right? Cells come from pre-existing cells. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I also know that you know obviously life had to start at some point from inorganic compounds, you know, abiogenesis. What is our biological like theory of everything that squares those two statements together? Well, whatever the solution to abiogenesis, I mean, it's not going to be <laughs> biology isn't as um you can't describe biology in terms of equations. You really can't. Some systems are just too complex. I mean, the weather is like that as well. You can't just write down an equation and then know the weather. You can simply write down an equation and then know forever how Halley's Comet will orbit. That's really nice because some things are actually that simple, but it won't be that way for life. But no, the our understanding of for abiogenesis is going to be massively complicated. It's, well, in a sense, it'll actually be fairly simple, but the, like the particular pathways will be complicated, but that's kind of how it is for, you know, if you want to understand how does a tornado form in a sense, it's actually quite simple, but in another sense, it's actually very complex, uh, how it specifically happens, which is why we can't actually predict with certainty when they will happen, we can know the conditions are just right, but we won't perfectly be able to predict them. And then even if, when we do, we don't know exactly where they're going to happen or how many of them will form. So that that's fair. I mean, ultimately we're dealing with, you know, mutations and, uh, you know, com complex chemistry, you know, things that are, you know, not just, simple you know it, it, it's not just as simple as like the reduction that it gets brought down to of oh it's just pond scum plus electricity you know or whatever uh the other thing i wanted to ask about is so as far as we can tell all organisms are part of the same tree of life um meaning they all have common descent um, uh, yes. So, Earth, obviously, is a great planet for hosting life. We have all kinds of diverse forms of life in just about every place on Earth. Um, why do you right. think we, we have not seen second or third or tenth trees of life spring up on a planet that is so <clears throat> rich for hosting life? Um, I think the simple answer to that is that might have actually happened early on um, and then all of it got outcompeted or wiped out by different forms. I could, I mean, it could have happened. Um, but the other reason, I think the reason it wouldn't happen today is wherever the environment exists, where the raw ingredients that could create life could spontaneously or the raw ingredients that could spontaneously form life exist. Why isn't it popping up there? Cause there's going to already be life there. And it simply abiogenesis can't compete against, uh, where you already have gobs and gobs of, of already living things. They're going to, they're going to take every single resource, like every time it's just not going to have the chance to do it. So to still man that, the, the niches that can support life already do support life. So yeah. uh, an organism starting from zero would have a hard time competing with organisms that were brought into or brought up in that environment already adapted to them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so you would put like, at least one filter for life early in in its um, early in its path. Like, you know, they talk about like the great filter and different filters that life has to go through to like continue to propagate. 
So you, you'd, you'd post don't, that. I don't know what you mean by that, actually. Oh, so like, um, there's like the theory of the great filter. It's like the threshold that organisms have to get past before they're successful. So it's like, um, you know, if there was life on another planet, um, it's like an answer to the Fermi paradox. So like, oh, why don't okay. we, why don't we um, encounter, you know, extraterrestrials everywhere? Well, it, it might be because there is some filter somewhere on the timeline of an organism's trajectory where, you know, like for us, we might end up nuking ourselves out of existence or it might be um, the ability to store ATP, um, you know, for, for a early cell might be a problem, you know, and if they don't, if an organism never incorporates in um, like mitochondria or takes on um, something like photosynthesis as its energy production method, then those forms of life never propagate and uh, become successful. You know? uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah. So you're just, just like some, some planets that have life, maybe planets that allow that life to become really interesting and complex and intelligent are maybe, maybe that's rare. That's pretty much all you're saying. Yeah. 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 Sure. Maybe, maybe so, it is. Yeah. Well, I, 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 that, that was the definition of what I was talking about, but then the question was, um, but I guess if you're not familiar with that, the question doesn't really make sense. But my question was like, would you put that filter in, in earth, in Earth's um, bio history as being early. So basically a lot of the competing trees of life would have been cut out really early because it's, it's just hard to get from a simple organism to a complex organism that's able to um, reproduce and replicate and store energy well. And, you know, um, cause I mean like the mitochondria, you know, being brought in is like, yeah. The miracle of our life. Yeah, the the endosymbiosis like that that probably has to happen in order for cells to be efficient enough to be truly multicellular and specialized and all that kind of stuff. And then it becomes a question of how how unlikely is endosymbiosis? For all we can tell, from what I remember, we think endosymbiosis probably happened around one and a half to 1.7 billion years ago. I don't think it was really before that. Um, I guess I have the internet here. Don't let chat, what is it doing, happen to you? I've taken 100 of the most common anti-scientific arguments and put together the research, the logic, and the facts to take them all down. Every copy is personally signed and shipped by me. There are also way over 100 additional misconceptions in my second book, facts that aren't true. Or if you prefer, there are full audio versions of both books, including all of the pictures used in the books. If you're interested, click the link in the description. So, I mean, I don't know how to, I, I think the only option we have is just to think intuitively about this because I don't know how to like calculate it or whatever, but, but life starts on this planet within just a few, maybe tens of millions of years after the, the crust was hardened and temperatures like allowed for it it happened so incredibly early on that that makes me think that life forming on some kind of planet that at least has the correct like geology mineralogy and has water on it maybe isn't super uncommon but then this thing I, if it if it took so many billions of years and it looks like i was a i was about right but maybe a little so we think Mitochondrial, 1.8 to 2 billion years ago. Chloroplast, 1.2 to 1.6 billion years ago. So not really not too far off. Um, but since that took uh, so incredibly long, even after, even after you had life, yeah, maybe, maybe that is wildly more improbable since it took so long. You know, that makes intuitive sense to me. So... And, and I mean, you know, you look and see, like, obviously water was not native to the planet. Water had to come from elsewhere, you know. I like the idea of it coming through bombardment of, you know, comets and things like that. I mean, that makes the most sense to me. Um, 
it could be that the earliest form of life on this planet was a passenger on one of those comets. I mean, that's not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't really answer any of our questions about how do you get life arising organically. It just right, right. just teleports life. Right. I mean, yeah, it still has to originate somewhere else. It makes yeah. a lot more sense than like the God. We don't we don't know that Earth's water had to come from elsewhere either. All right, we actually don't. Ooh. We we cannot. Uh, it, I can never memorize all of these problems, but there are like chemical and isotopic issues with like every time we try to figure out where did Earth's water come from, there's a really big mismatch um, because it doesn't match what's in the comets for whatever the specific chemical reasons are. I don't know. It doesn't exactly match. Uh, well, could the water just have because asteroids, meteorites, whatever, they have tiny, tiny amounts of water in them. And we think that the Earth has all this water, but actually, if you have like a regular globe, a, a one foot diameter globe, um, and you want to know how much uh, water you would need to add to it to make it actually to scale, it's only 15 milliliters, really small amount of, of water actually. So um, if you take the tiny amount of water that asteroids and meteorites, and yes, there would have been some comets too, have in them and just scale it up to the size of a planet, you can get the amount of water that Earth has. Uh, and actually, there are moons in our solar system that are thousands of times smaller than Earth but have more water than the whole Earth has. But there are chemical, whatever, isotopic problems with those too. Again, I don't, I don't have any of them memorized, but we just don't... We don't actually have a, a silver bullet hypothesis for that, sadly. Okay, yeah, I, you, you kind of uh, brought some new information to me there. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, PBS Space Time has a really good video on it. Okay, I'll have to check that out. But yeah, man, uh, I appreciate you. Thanks for bringing me up. You're welcome. This video and all my videos is on my Patreon ad-free, and you can get a free copy of my first book by being a member too. Plus, your name will appear in the end credits. Thank you.